Right now he's, he's received a, a stay, and, and the stay is not quite conclusive as to how long that stay could be. It, it should be at least two weeks due to technical, technical considerations, but longer than that is, is up in the air. We won't know more until an appeal of this is for December 4th. Um, Mr. O'Kay okay came to our attention due to letters of a student on campus here, Jeff Weiss, who has maintained a correspondence with Mr. O'Kay okay for the past four or five months, and they've developed quite a relationship, and his situation has been brought to us via Jeff's efforts and, and Jeff's correspondence with him. On the panel tonight, Jeff Weiss will be one of the panel members, and he'll talk more about his relationship with Mr. O'Kay. Okay. Also in tonight's discussion, John Donaghy from St. Thomas Aquinas Church, the Catholic Church will be here as part of our panel discussion to discuss the death penalty in general. So tonight's discussion will focus in the absence of Mr. O'Kay on a panel discussion involving Jeff discussing the particular aspects of Mr. O'Kay's case and, and the death penalty as it relates to him, as well as John Donaghy discussing the general aspects of the death penalty more from a moral principle. And um, as well as a half hour videotape, which Jeff and Abram and myself made when we went down to Lincoln to visit Mr. O.K. on um, the week of Thanksgiving break, from which we took three hours of video and, and cut a half hour. But let me just introduce to start this thing off the man who's mostly responsible for all this being here tonight, through whose efforts um, all of us are aware of, of this individual on death row. Could you just welcome Jeff Weiss? I just want to say a few words uh, before we show the video. I came into contact with Mr. Ote um, in August, a person who was at Nebraska State Penitentiary and who was released. Uh, I corresponded with him, and he told me about this person who was on death row, who, when he, for a long time, had no money and ran out of, uh, he could buy cigarettes and coffee and those things, that this man uh, bought those things for him and he was a really great guy. Then he also told me that he wrote poetry and upon showing me those two books of poetry, I was blown away as everybody who has ever read uh, Willie's poetry is blown away. And it was then that I began uh, corresponding with Willie and we corresponded for quite some time. When we began to look into Willie's case, um, his specific case, there are questions of his guilt and innocence. Um, but beyond that, we took a look at the death penalty. And I don't know how many people know this, but in the history of this country, no white person has ever been executed for killing a person of color. Uh, if you're African American, you're eight times more likely to get the death penalty than if you're white. And in Willie's case, he is accused of raping and murdering a white woman 12 years ago. And the, the race factor there, I think, is evident in what gave him the death penalty other than the uh, life in prison. Um, so I think what we'll do right now is just show the video to you all and you'll be able to see um, what a, a person on death row and judge for yourself. What's that? Question, um, the inspiration for Willie's poetry said, I think that the major inspiration for me is injustice. Uh, I forgot to mention too that Willie is an interesting person. He's been on death row for 12 years and he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't watch television, although I've been told that he does watch Married with Children, so I can't totally say he doesn't watch any television. Um, but he spends his time studying all the time. They have a, what's called a law library there, and he's read over, I don't know if it's 6,000 books, I'm not sure. Uh, he writes poetry, he writes short stories. In fact, he's published uh, two books of poetry. This is one right here. And in fact, we have about 25 copies of this book, and we are uh, selling them for 
five dollars a piece if anybody's interested and the money that we get will be sent directly to Billy. Um, I just want to share before uh, we go on here real quick if you all have any questions or anything and to John to talk a little bit about the death penalty. I just want to share a little bit about something that you wrote in one of my letters. It has to do with uh, you know the system and the problems going on and, and everything. He says, too often the focus is on the word education, but I believe it has to go further than that. It has to begin with the terminology of a term we have so little in common with, love. Love of self in order that we can love each other. Very simple, I believe. If we love life, then we no longer need to destroy it. We no longer desire to fear it, which is our greatest God. So right now, um, I would like to introduce uh, John Lennon up to up here to maybe talk a little bit about the death penalty and if you all have any questions about uh, Willie and his case or anything else. We would have, we're going to have two other people on the panel, but due to the weather, we were not able to. We also talked about showing the video um, again sometime next semester because the weather, um, you know, hurt some of the turnout tonight. But I want to thank you all for coming because this is a great turnout considering no one's died on the way here. <laughs> I'm driving the car. Can I sit up here? Too? Yeah. I'll I guess the one thing I'd like to just mention, or just a couple of things is, the first thing to note is that the United States is the only Western industrialized major power that still has the death penalty and still practices the death penalty. Western Europe, no. In fact, much of Latin America even has abolished the death penalty. Canada has abolished the death penalty. But the United States is pretty much in the realm of a couple of countries like South Africa, the Soviet Union, Iraq, and Iran that still have the death penalty or company to keep in terms of this. And I guess the whole thing is, I just, there's a whole bunch of myths about the death penalty. And the one myth, the really big myth, is that it's a deterrent. And there have been several studies, and most of them are inconclusive. My training, both in terms of philosophy and in terms of theology, is that you give the benefit of doubt to life. So you might say one is innocent and proven guilty. And so therefore, at the very least, if there's no deterrent effect, or no provable deterrent effect, why is it there? I think there's two reasons it's there. Two among many, but the two ones I'd like to just mention. The one is, I'd say, the shortcut solution. I think much in our society, we feel overwhelmed by powerlessness, by the crime that, that there is around us. And rather than trying to deal with the causes of the crime, rather than trying to work through those things and trying to create social situations to deal with the crime, people will come up with a shortcut solution and say, well, this is the way to get rid of crime. Kill, kill the person who did it. That to me is both theological and moral. The other thing I think that you have to think is when you get down to it, I think the main reason that, that there's a death penalty is that people are motivated by their revenge. And to me, that's just immoral. And what it does is brutalizes our society. The death penalty not only is kills people, but it brutalizes our society. What is the effect of a society that is motivated by revenge? For me, it shows that there's something wrong. That there's something wrong with the society that's, that will, will see that. And then if we continue to do this, we're going to be in, major, in a major problem. So I really think the U.S. has to change this policy. Let me close with two brief remarks. I could talk for hours about this. When I taught an introduction to ethics course, I usually like to spend the class or two debunking the death penalty. But two of the things that, that hit me very much, one of them is the very fact is that 
in the world, in a world where the nations have have uh, arrogated massive power to themselves, in a world where the nations have arrogated the use of nuclear weapons, where they've arrogated torture, the use of torture, where they've done these things to themselves, one of the first things we need to do, and this is how Dr. Kamu's main point, is to deny the state the authority to kill. We need to deny the state the authority to kill. To take the life. It's like the button I'm wearing. It's a, it's a 15 year old button. Why do we kill people who kill people to show that killing people is wrong? It's really that, that, that sense is that we must find a different way of doing it. But the, the last thing I'd like to say, and this comes from my faith connection, is I wear a cross around my, my neck. And I think a lot of people don't realize that that was the electric chair of the day. Maybe the ultimate, the ultimate protest that Christians should do these days is to wear little electric chairs around their neck and recognize and recognize the death penalty is, is a violation of all that there is good. It's a violation of a God of life who went, as I believe, that Jesus was faced with the woman who was going to be stoned to death and said, let the person without sin cast the first stone. And in, this, in the world where nations and people are not sinless, to arrogate, to give the country a nation. That authority is insane and is in war, and I think it's leading us into a really dangerous situation. As I said, I could talk for hours, but that's all I'd like to just say and be glad to dialogue or whatever. And can I mention real quick, actually we weren't really sure about what we were going to do tonight because <laughs> Willie's execution was scheduled to take place on December 5th which is, what, three days from now. And he got a last-minute stay of execution uh, by the Nebraska Supreme Court. And the logistics, the legal logistics of that are December 4th, they will probably start hearing us, what's called the successor plea, which uh, Mr. Suchi, Willie's lawyer, will make an appeal in, in the Nebraska Supreme Court. But the good news is that they took what's called a death warrant away. And in order to renew the death warrant, that takes 14 days. So we know the execution is not going to take place on December 5th. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska has not executed a person since 1959. That was Charles Starkweather. And we know it's not going to take place on the 5th, and we know it can't take place two weeks after that. So um, death row, is, it's just a wait and see. It's interesting reading Willie's letters. You know, he prepares himself to die, and then he gets a stay. And, you know, his... Emotions range all over the place. He, he's up, real up in some letters, and other letters he's real down. But I'll just read two of his poems right now, then I'd like to get some reaction from you all. The first one is called Death Poem. Could you walk unes unescorted to your death? Could you pass that group of strangers and not bat an eye? Could you ingest the volts and volts that make you jerk and contort and not cry out? Could you wait years and years envisioning you strapped in that chair? Would you ever close your eyes, afraid you missed a moment of life? Would you, would you give a damn that they murdered you? I say I will not flinch, will not sob, will not faint. I say I will not ask anyone I love to be there. Will not eat their offerings of a special meal. Will not write anybody goodbye. I say I will not want any tears shed, will not hear any prayers, will not beg any God to save me. I say drink wine and dance party when they murder me, because the next time I say it will be you. And I want to now read a, a much lighter poem that Willie wrote. It must have been about his childhood. I once had a two-wheeler. I kept it in the house out of the rain, away from the snow and the thief. I talked to it sometimes when I rode down streets and across fields. That bike was my friend, and when I grew older, I came to believe 
that best friends are bicycles, dreams, and trees. They don't hurt people. I once had a book. I slept with it under my pillow. Um, so, can I get any reaction from you all what you thought about the video? This is the first time that we've shown it to anybody. Or reactions to the video or any questions you might have concerning Willie's case or the death penalty in general. And how many of you knew that no white person in this country has ever been executed for the killing of a person of color? <laughs> well, I knew you guys knew. <laughs> Um, Willie himself maintains his innocence to this day. The main two things that the police have to go on is a confession that was made in a town in Florida where Willie uh, allegedly confessed to the crime. Willie himself says that this was a forced confession, that uh, he, was, he was scared, he didn't know if he would ever make it out of that room, etc. And they talked and he filled in the blanks. Uh, he maintains his innocence, like I said, to this day. There was a stereo that was taken out of the, the house when the murder took place. And it was, uh, I guess, a low-scale brand of Panasonic that you can get at, like Radio Shack. And they don't have, every one of them do not have specific serial numbers on them. But they found a stereo in Chicago that Willie had sold to somebody that was a low brand Panasonic stereo. Um, Willie said he just bought the stereo. You know, he, did, he said that it wasn't, uh, well, the stereo, whatever. But they did, they can't link it up specific serial numbers, but like I say, they don't have them, but that was where he was linked up. Um, more on Willie's side, uh, there's no forensic evidence that Willie, you know, was in the house. They took 158 fingerprints and none of those fingerprints matched Willie. After the murder, he was arrested, I believe it was nine months after the crime took place. And it was a real heinous crime. It was a rape and, and murder of a woman. And it was a real heinous crime. What we talk about on our petition is not so much his guilt or innocence, but there is the question of a fair trial. Willie's public defender had three other trials that he was doing the two weeks up until Willie's trial and he met with Willie four times and the day that he was supposed to go to court Willie's lawyer Mr. Riley the public defender went to the judge and said we're not ready I need a continuance and the judge said hey you, know, you people down at the public defender's office gotta get your stuff together we're going on trial whether you know whether you want it or not um, so there were three federal district judges that, that alluded to the fact that Willie did not receive a fair trial um, during one of the appeals. They, they wrote out dissenting opinions, but he's already went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. He's used all his direct appeal, and the second round of appeals is habeas corpus appeals. And I, I guess you know the most that we can hope for is that they commute his sentence to a life in prison. That's what we're hoping for. I mean, none of us are saying free him or anything. We're just trying to um, have his sentence commuted for a number of reasons and for what he can contribute to society. I think he's working on a, a third book of poetry too. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. In fact, Willie was scared to death about this videotape. We, we originally, like I said, the Committee on Lectures asked Willie to come here and speak. When Willie couldn't come here and speak, we talked to the warden, and he told us over the phone that we could make a videotape. Well, we asked him if we could make a videotape over the phone, and he said, you, you can make one. And so when, when we, uh, but he said, Willie doesn't give interviews. And so he said, Willie will call you back within a half hour and let you know. So he calls back and Willie says, yeah, come on down and do it. But Willie told us specifically to only play this 
to you know the concerned people at this university because the problem with the media is when they they'll have a, a two-minute story about this upcoming execution they devote you know a minute and a half to the specific gory details of the crime you know in in great detail and then they do the last 20 seconds on one of Willie's poems by the time the two-minute thing gets over what we hear down there people are calling the television stations mad as hell you're spending my tax dollars to let this you know what write poetry they're mad because in the media in the tele in the uh, the media in there the print like at the Omaha World Herald they don't refer to Willie as Harold Lamont Ote or even Willie they call him Walking Willie um, which is because when he, he was arrested at Axar Ben in Omaha, his job was walking the horses back in the racetrack. And so they kind of, they sensationalize things, walking Willie. I mean, it sounds like stalking Willie or something. And then they also print the worst possible picture of him that you could print, you know, make, try to make him look as scary as possible. And they print the confession in great detail. And they don't ever say that, you know, Willie said, this is not a confession. They never say that. They just print the confession. And they sensationalize things so much that he doesn't want anything to do with the media. 48 Hours, uh, their producer, Bob Lang, wanted to give an interview. But it turns out they don't care or want to talk. CBS doesn't care or want to talk to Willie. All they want to do is follow him around on the day that they fry him. You know, on the day they put him to death, they want to follow him around. They don't care about Willie, you know. He says, you know, like Willie says, there's a difference between you know, being committed or being committed to the cause. There's the people down there with the Nebraskans against the death penalty. Willie says he doesn't really like them because he'll call them and ask them to, um, you know, get an address for him or come visit him, and they never will. And so he's like, you know, I think he's a little suspicious of people who are for the cause of the death penalty but really don't, you know, spend their energies towards the people on death row. But there is quite a bit of attention actually in Lincoln, but with the common people it's negative because of what the media portray. Yeah. Abolished. Abolished. Abolished completely. Everywhere and anywhere. I'm not a I'm not a legal scholar. I'm not a person into the 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 punishment system or whatever they call it in the the prison system in this country. So I am not in that way. But what it is is I think we need to if there if there is a need and I, I emphasize if, if there's a need that some people be, be uh, separated off from society, we ought to find a way to do it in which they're treated at least as human beings and not as dogs, or That's worse true. than dogs. Dogs are treated better uh, than some people in prisons. That's, true. Uh, that's the one thing. The second thing is we need to really begin, and I think one of the things is we begin to deal with questions of alternatives to imprisonment. I mean, there's incredible things that are being done, even in the state of Iowa, even in the city of Ames, in terms of uh, victim-offender uh, type of, of work, in terms of mediation and the like, preventing uh, the use of prisons for, for crimes where there is no need for any of that. So there are things being done by a lot of scholars in, in that area. And what it is is we need to find things that are humane, that really, that really are indicative, because what we do to prisoners is probably very indicative of our, of our vision of the world and we need to find a, a new vision of the world and therefore a new way of dealing with the whole question of, of, uh, of our prisons or our criminal quote unquote justice system. So I think that's the thing I'd say is the criminal justice system has to be looked at. Alternatives to both to imprisonment need to be dealt with. And, and the death penalty needs to be abolished completely, everywhere and anywhere.
And there have been a number of cases where there have been people who have been executed and afterwards it's been discovered that they were not the persons who did it. Or there have been cases that people were in death row for a long time and someone else confessed and then they were later released. I mean, those are, there are enough cases. I say that one person killed unjustly uh, is, just shows that the whole, the whole idea of killing an, an individual is in the death penalty is bogus. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Well, it, it must have been a lot of times, given all the appeals. You know, first of all, appealing to the Nebraska Supreme Court, then appealing to the Federal District Court, and actually ending up appealing all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Um, it, it must have been a lot of times, but I don't know how many. Yeah. Is there any chance that his execution is delayed to the end of well, next year and that it's possible that the new governor of Nebraska would be a sentence of life? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's possible because, like I say, with this stay in the Nebraska Supreme Court, um, they could decide to either, you know, to put off the execution for months or for a couple of weeks. You know, we don't know. It's, it's really uncertain. So. It's possible that when the new governor comes in, then you know, they will be set with that choice. One of the things that he still has, too, is a last minute what's called a clemency hearing. And that's a last ditch effort where you appear before the governor, the attorney general, and the secretary of state of, the, of, Lincoln, of Lincoln, Nebraska. And is that right? Secretary of state? <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> I think it's, keep thinking James Baker. <laughs> um, but that's a last ditch effort, you know, a clemency hearing. And there is always that option. And he might have a, have a good chance, you know, at a clemency hearing too. It's interesting that he still maintains his innocence to this day too, because when I've talked to uh, other prisoners, it's, it's unusual that somebody strongly maintains their innocence for a, a long period of time like this. And, you know, it does not waver on it or does not just give up. I mean, it, you'd get tired of it, you know, but, yeah. Um, I was just curious, that sign of the petition that you guys had up all here a yeah. ago. Um, two questions. What, what did you guys do with those things you submitted to? Okay, those petitions are going to be sent to Governor Orr. In fact, we haven't sent all the petitions yet because Willie's attorney, Tim Ford, he's from the NAACP Legal Fund, he's in uh, Seattle, Washington. He said that the, the, the smallest amount of publicity, the better. It's actually a different strategy and it kind of hit us with surprise and we were glad that we didn't send a lot of petitions in. Um, he, he, his strategy, Willie's lawyer's strategy is to not create very much publicity about the whole thing in Lincoln. Because, and it's probably, apparently he's a, he's a tremendous lawyer, one of the best in the country. And so, it's nice that Willie got hooked up with him because um, his legal representation up to this point has not, you know, not been very good. Yeah, I want to thank you all for coming on this night, <laughs> and everybody drive home safely, and um, we will probably be doing maybe